All right, so first of all, what is machine learning? Um, it's basically a new approach towards modeling um, some kind of phenomenon. So in traditional modeling, you have your data set, and then you usually have like some random guy who knows a lot about the data set, and he uses his past experience and the current data set to build a model. Whereas um, in machine learning, it's a little bit different. You have your data, except instead of the human building the model, the, the algorithm itself is building the model based on the data set. So I guess to make that more concrete, um, a really basic example is linear regression. Like it's, it's basically curve fitting by itself. And strictly speaking, that actually counts as machine learning, but obviously no one calls it that because then you just sound like a goofball. Um, so, in order to develop a machine learning model, there's different steps. First, you got to acquire the data, and obviously that, that seems, I mean, it seems pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised how hard it is to acquire data, especially in a uh, medical context. And you have to pre-process the data, because sometimes there's missing values, or it might be inaccurate, or you only need certain parts of the data set. And on um, feature selection is just determining what the inputs for the model are. So for example, let's say um, you're trying to like build a model that identifies cats versus dogs. So um, one feature could be maybe like the size of the animal or like the color of the animal, etc. The model building is where you actually construct the uh, I guess like the architecture of the model. So so think of it as the model itself changes as it iterates through the data set, but you need to create sort of like, I guess like a starting point for the model, because obviously it's not just going to appear out of thin air, right? And the model training is when the model is learning from the data set. So at that point, you're just sort of sitting at your computer and waiting for it to run, and that takes a really long time. And then afterwards, you test it against a separate data set to see how well that it's actually working. So the data set that we'll be using is from the Broad Institute. And basically, there's about 1,300 images. And with all the images together, there's about 80,000 cells. And there's six different classes. So obviously, red blood cells and white blood cells are normal. The other four, those are the different variants of malaria-infected cells. And the good thing about this data set is that it comes from three independent sources. So the idea is if they're not from the same source, then you're less likely to overfit your model. So as far as navigating the data set, um, there's two JSON files. And um, basically, it has the, the image name and then the file. Here, it tells you um, what the dimensions of the image are. So this one's 1383 by 1944. There's three channels for R, G, and B. And then this is the coordinates of a specific cell within the image. And then here is the classification of the cell. So that's, that's basically how we're going to know um, what, what cell type each, each of the cells in the image are. So as far as feature selection, um, it's actually pretty difficult to do, but luckily the model that we're using, it does it implicitly, which is not usually the case. So basically our model will be doing feature selection by itself. But just for the sake of knowing what it is, just because it's so important for machine learning, it's, it's like I said earlier, it's just extracting useful attributes that are relevant for your model. So like useful examples here is like shape or like heterogeneity of the cell. Um, realistically, you probably wouldn't use that because that's really ambiguous as far as programming that. But that's just a very high level uh, feature to give you guys an idea. And then poor example would be color because as you can see here, they're both the same color. It doesn't really discriminate anything. Yeah? Uh, what do you mean by heterogeneity? So? Um, so basically, if you look at the normal cell, other than the nuclei, it's pretty much like I guess like the same texture, so to speak. If you look at if you look at the infected cell, the uh, the color just the not color the uh, intensity distribution is much more uh, I guess like scattered. Yeah. Uh, 
So the reason why feature selection is so important is because if you do not have enough features, you are at the risk of underfitting your model. And basically what that means is you're, cap you're not capturing all the information that you need to know. And if you're using too many uh, features, like for example, let's say you accidentally extracted noise as a feature, which sounds dumb, but in reality, you don't know what is noise and what isn't. So if you extract noise, your model might be trying to fit the noise. And then if that happens, you're overfitting. So then when you test it against a separate data set, your accuracy actually goes down a lot. So at the graph up there, model complexity is basically number of features. So too many, if the model is too complex, overfitting happens. If the model is not complex enough, underfitting happens. Um, yeah. So for developing a model, there are parameters and hyperparameters. So the difference is that the parameter is basically what the model learns. So if we go back to the case of linear regression, um, the parameters would be like A and B, right? A being the slope, B being the, uh, the offset, whatever you call it. So like the user does not determine that, the model determines that. But for a hyperparameter, it dictates how the model learns. So um, I guess going back to linear regression again, just because it's easy to visualize, a hyperparameter is, are you doing line regression? Are you doing logistic? Are you doing polynomial? So basically, the user defines that, whereas parameters, the model uh, develops it by itself. So typically, when you develop a model, what that means is the user gives the model a set of hyperparameters. And then using those sets of hyperparameters, the model determines its own parameters and gives you an accuracy. So you pick the model that performed the best with the, uh, with the best set of hyperparameters. So as you can see in this picture, um, using the third set of hyperparameters resulted in a better overall accuracy. So that's how you determine how you want to set up the, uh, the architecture of your model. So as far as actually training the model, uh, you split your data into training data and test data. And then for the training data, you use, there's a method called k-fold cross-validation. This is the simplest method of cross-validation. And basically, you split your training data into k number of groups. So here, this is five-fold cross-validation. You see that your training data is split into five groups. And what happens is one of those groups is called the validation set, and the other four are used to train the model. So basically, for each iteration, um, a different subset of the training data is the validation set. And then after, you, after all of them are the validation set, um, you basically look at all, all of the different iterations, and then you pick the, the model picks the set of parameters that gives the best overall performance. So for example, let's say you have one set of parameters. It does really well in split one, but it does really poorly in the next four. That means it's probably overtrained. Whereas if you have a set of parameters that performs well in all five, that means it's, it's not overfitting. So that's probably the best one to use. And then afterwards, you, pick, you use that model, and then you apply it to the test data to get the um, get the final accuracy, so to speak. So as far as testing the model, we have something called a confusion matrix. If you look at the rows, um, each uh, the first row is if the truth value is no, uh, false, negative, like however you want to think about it. And then the second row is if it's positive. And then if you look at the columns, the first column is if your model says it's negative. And the second column is if your model says it's positive. So obviously, your model won't always agree with the actual truth value. So here, you can sort of compare and see um, like how well it's doing. So a true positive is if the ground truth is true, and then your model says it's true. And then true negative is if the model says it's false, and then in reality, it's also false. So then false positive means your model 
marks it as positive, but it's really negative, and then false negative. You guys, you guys probably get the idea from now. So some ba basic measurements that we use to measure the accuracy is um, sensitivity and specificity. And for sensitivity, it basically means out of a pool of, I guess, data points that are actually, actually true, how many of them does the model identify as true? So like, for example, if you say the sensitivity is 90%, then that means 90 out of 100 times where the case is positive, the model accurately identifies it as positive. Whereas specificity is kind of the opposite. It's like how well is it able to detect uh, true negatives. And then positive predictivity and negative predicti uh, predictivity is kind of um, if, you, if you like swap the... Uh, no, it's not a good explanation. So for positive predictivity is if it's if the model says it's positive, how many how much of it is actually positive? So it's kind of um, a different perspective. So some not so useful measurements is accuracy. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, misclassification rate is just the opposite of accuracy. If accuracy is ninety, misclassification is ten. Um, the reason why it's not useful is. Um, so everyone uses this example. The HIV prevalence in the US is 0.3%. So if you develop a so-called model that just assumes you don't have HIV, statistically speaking, you will be accurate 99.7% of the time, when in practice, you're basically doing nothing because you are not going to catch a single case of HIV. So that's why we tend to try to avoid using accuracy as a measurement because it can be pretty misleading. So if you look at the figure on the right, um, the first curve is a distribution of normal patients. The second curve is a distribution of abnormal patients. And it's basically plotted along the x-axis, where the x-axis is sort of a uh, decision threshold. So like, let's, let's say theoretically you are somehow able to compile all of the information about a patient into a single number. And then based on that single number, you're like, if, if their value is above this, they're positive. If they're below that, it's negative. So obviously, you have to draw a decision threshold shown here. And depending on how you move that threshold, your sensitivity and specificity is different. So like on the extreme example, if you put your decision threshold um, way out along the x-axis, you're marking everyone as uh, negative or normal. So in that case, the sensitivity would be zero, right? Because you're not detecting any of the true positives. So as if you try to visualize it, as you move the decision threshold back closer to the y-axis, the uh, sensitivity starts increasing, but the uh, specificity starts decreasing just because of the natural distribution of the two populations. Um, for people who haven't learned this in class yet, uh, I would recommend looking into this a little bit more because at first it can actually be a little bit confusing, but we're, we're a little bit limited on time, so I'm just trying to fly through it. But yeah, so those are the basics of what you need to know for machine learning. Now to actually jump into how neural networks work. Um, so basically, we'll first be covering something called a multi-layer perceptron, or MLP, and it's the simplest type of um, neural network. So here we have a picture of a biological neuron. This is why it's, this is kind of where the name came from. And then above it, you have something that's called a, a node, but we'll, we'll just call it a neuron anyways, just so you guys can sort of relate it. So basically, the neuron has different inputs. As you can see, x0, x1, all the way to xm. And then for all of these inputs, you assign a weight, which is labeled as w. And then you add all of those weighted inputs together to get something called um, uh, v, v subscript k. And that's the, that's the final input value. And then you put that input value through an activation function. And what the activation function does is it basically maps an input to a given output. So um, we'll, we'll go more into that later. But basically, 
um, that's how you that's how you transform the input to the output. So so if you look at so these are the common types of activation functions. Um, a step function means if if the input is positive, then the output's one. If the input's negative, the output's zero. If in linear function, it it basically doesn't really do anything. Like the output is equal to the input, or you can scale it if you want, like two x. Then you're double. The output is twice of the input. But the most important one is um, is actually the last one, the re relu function. And basically, if the input is negative, the output is zero. And then if the input is positive, the output is whatever the input was. Um, it's, it's also called a ramp function, if that helps for you double E's out there. Um, so for the neural network, there's three sections. There's the input layer, where all of your, basically where your data is entering. And then there's the output layer, which gives you the classification. And then in between, you have hidden layers. It could be anywhere from zero to like, I don't know, a few hundred. So, so in the case where it's zero, there's only an input and an output layer. But basically, the hidden layer is the most complicated part. That is where it does a series of calculations. So as you can see here, the inputs go into the first layer. They give a set of outputs that go into the second layer, and so forth. And then eventually they reach the output layer where all the values have been um, calculated and then you get your classification results. Um, so no, the, the reality is for the hidden layers, the calculations are very complex to the point where even like data scientists, they don't really know what's going on on the inside. It's kind of a black box. So don't worry too much about like like everything in between, so to speak. So training this, training this model is an iterative process. So you give it an initial guess on the weights. So when you're training the model, you're, you're trying to find the ideal weights for the inputs that feed into the uh, different neurons. So if you go back here, you're basically trying to find the correct values of all the double variables, uh, W variables. So then you have your initial guess, and then it does all the calculations. It gives out its classification as its output. You compare that to the truth, and then you see if your classification is correct. And then obviously the classification is going to be wrong just because it's your first guess. So then you propagate that error backwards through the network. And then through by analyzing the error, you update your weights so that your next set of weights should be should give a more accurate result. So it's it's sort of like it's just a sort of um, back and forth passing of information. As it moves forward, it's calculating the classification. As it moves back, it's providing the error for each of the different neurons. So if you look at that figure um, on the bottom right, you can see the function signals going forward, the error signals going back. So this is um, basically a repeat of what I said. So let's just take some time to look at the figure. So here you see Wij. So that's the weight for the input from the i neuron to the j jth neuron in the next layer and then obviously each one of these connections is a is a different wij and then here it's the same concept you have each of the neurons output goes to all of the neurons as an input in the next layer and th just try to get used to this notation because we'll be using it a lot soon so for adjusting the weights for each neuron, we, we represent that as w, uh, delta wij. So basically, that's how much you're adjusting the weights by. Uh, mu is just, not mu, I don't know what that's called. The, the learning rate is basically how fast the weights are adjusted. So for example, if the learning rate is really high, then you, com you converge on the solution faster. But if the learning rate but if it's too high, you might completely overshoot the solution, and then you end up with no solution. 
So um, I guess the best way to describe that is you're less likely to converge on a solution, but if you do, it'll be faster. So if your learning rate is super slow, or uh, super low, then it'll be super slow and takes a long time to train the model. Um, delta J is uh, something that we call the uh, local gradient. And basically what that means is the, um, it's the, it's the value of the output of the neuron with respect to the error. And um, we'll, we'll go more into that later, so don't worry too much about delta right now. And then yi is the I put, uh, output from the ith layer, and it feeds as the input into the jth layer. So like, all of these are yi, and they're multiplied by the weight, and then it becomes um, the inputs for these, which give more outputs that are yj. So as you can see here, the output is just the input feed it into the activation function. And then the input is just a summation of the uh, values from the previous layer. So the most important equation here is the first one. The weight adjustment is equal to the learning rate times the um, inputs from the previous layer times the local gradient. So inputs is pretty simple. You just plug that in. And then learning rate, you set that beforehand. So that's also pretty simple. The hardest part is calculating the local gradient. So the local calculating the local gradient is different for a hidden neuron, which are these, compared to an output neuron, which are these. So depending on which neuron that you're trying just the weights for, the calculation method is different. So this is just um, the equation that we saw earlier. So this is for an output neuron, not, not hidden neurons. So basically, in order to calculate the local gradient, um, it's equal, oh, I got that swap earlier. Yeah, it's equal to the derivative of the error with respect to the input. And then you apply the chain rule, and eventually you see that is equal to the e error, which is ej times the derivative of the activation function. And obviously, we don't know the error just uh, just yet. So taking the derivative is easy. We already know our activation function. In order to find the error, you compare the desired outcome with the calculated outcome. So let's say in the extreme case, the, the predicted value is the same as the true value, then the error is 0 because it cancels out. And then obviously, the greater the difference, the greater the error. Um, so, so that wasn't too bad. For hidden neurons, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, the, the first part is the same. As you can see, derivative of error with respect to input. And then, but then you have to apply the chain rule again. And then, so again, we know the derivative of the activation function but we don't know the derivative of the error with respect to the calculated outcome, so we need to find that first. So, so um, this is the error of the hidden neuron. You differentiate, and then you get, you get this, which you plug into there, but you don't know this value. And this is equal to um, the, the summation of the error times the derivative of the error with respect to the output and then you do the chain rule, and then you plug that in. But the problem is you don't know what these values are either, so then you have to, you have to take the weights, and you have to take the derivative of the activation function, and you plug it into that. And it's, ba it's basically a bunch of math. I wouldn't worry too much about understanding all of this. Um, the main point here is that the, the network takes a long time to train, because you have to deal with this. And um, you, you can... So they take a few shortcuts, but more or less it's a lot of calculations. And this is just to illustrate the point that training this model takes a lot more calculations than something like linear regression, where you just have a few summations and you slap it together and you have your answer. All right, so back to the big picture. Um, so as a recap, correcting the weights is equal to the learning rate times the local gradient times the input of the um, previous neurons. So over time, as you, through e each iteration, they call it an uh, epoch, 
I'm not really sure why. I feel like iteration is fine. But, but basically, every epoch is a cycle of updating the weights. And as you can see this graph here, generally speaking, as the number of epochs increase, your accuracy goes up. And then eventually, it converges on a uh, maximum accuracy. Um, I'm not really sure why this one goes past 1. But, but anyways, it converges to maximum accuracy. So for, for convolutional neural networks, there are actually a special variant of multi-layer perceptrons. And this is what you use for image recognition. Because if you recall the multi-layer perception, perception here, all the inputs have to be numbers, right? Well, an image isn't exactly like, you, you, can't, you can't just slap an image as the input here. So we had to adjust our neural network a little bit. And then you get something called a convolutional neural network. So images are stored as a 3D uh, matrix. So if you see a picture, um, well, that's basically how humans see things. And with computers, you have um, three layers of a 2D matrix. So one layer, for, one layer is red, the other layer is green, the third layer is blue. And then that's, that's how, so it has the values for all the different colors at different pixels. And then within one of these matrices, you have a bunch of pixels. These are just the intensities for each distribution. So like, for example, if, if, this, if the dimensions of this one matrix was like uh, 1080 or whatever HD video is, like that, that means there's 180 pixels times uh, the, the other dimension. So yeah, um, our images are JPEG, so they're colored. So we have a 3D array. If you have a black and white image, it's just a single 2D array because there's only one set of intensities. So this is the part where we slow down a little bit because all the, the past two sections were just sort of a brief introduction so that we can reach this point. But this section is the part where you guys really need to make sure you understand because this will have a very direct impact on how we get through our project. So for the convolutional neural network architecture, there's um, generally speaking, there's four components. There's the convolution layer, there's the pooling layer, there's the R uh, ReLU layer, which is, the, which is what we talked about earlier, and then the classification layer. So we'll go into all these more in depth in the next few slides. But um, one, one thing to note is that the classification layer is this last segment. And this layer is actually, the, the structure is identical to, to a uh, multi-layer perceptron. So training this segment is basically everything that we covered in the last section. All right, so we have th these things called kernels and filters. So uh, kernels are the same thing as a mask, convolution matrix, they're all called the same thing. And they're used for feature detection. So recall earlier, feature extraction is where we try to get um, descriptions of our data set. So in the context of images, um, a feature would be like, for example, an edge that's oriented a certain direction, or if there's like a gradient within the image, like intensity drops over a given area, blurring, etc. So these are some examples of filters. So here you can see that this detects vertical edges because you see that the values here are higher than the values adjacent to it. And then likewise here is for horizontal edges because the middle, middle row has higher values than the first and last row. And then the, the other two you can sort of just accept, uh, extrapolate. So we have something called a filter. And a filter is basically a collection of kernels. So for example, uh, you can set one filter to arbitrarily contain all four of these kernels. And then basically, yeah, so basically a filter is a set of kernels. And in order to apply the filter 
with the image. You do something called a convolution. Um, convolutions are a little bit abstract if you haven't learned it in class yet. Um, you can sort of visualize it as, I guess, like... So, so when I learned about it, we always called it the flip and slide. And basically, you take this filter and then you slide it across the image. And then for each position, you calculate a value that gets output to the filtered image here. So for example, one value, another, etc. cetera. And um, this is the mathematical description of it, but it's usually easier to understand if you just visualize it instead. So notice here that the filtered image is smaller than the original image. That, that would be important later, but that's just something to take note of. So in this visual here, we have a filter with three kernels. And in this case, it's a kernel for each, um, each color, so R, G, and B. So after you, filter, after you apply, apply the kernel and convolute it with the image to get the filtered image, you add the filtered images from all the kernels together. And then you get, I guess, like a composite image. And then afterwards, you add a bias to it, if you want. The bias isn't necessary. And then you get your final, final output. So we have something called stride length. And that basically tells you how far the filter shifts after each convolution. So if the stride length is equal to 1, it shifts by 1 pixel every time, as you can see in this diagram. If the stride length is 2, then it shifts by 2. And then, as you can see, you get a smaller output. And if you run into a case where the output, if, if you run into a case where it's undesirable for the output to be smaller than the input, you can do something called padding. And basically, you're adding a bunch of zeros outside of the image. So then the idea is the output volume will be the same as the input volume. So that way, you can sort of maintain um, the dimension. But usually, that's not a problem. That's just an option if it is a problem. So the, so the convolutional layers is basically the layer where all of these kernel and filters are being applied. So if you have, so the, so the input is a 3D matrix where the third dimension is three because of the three different colors. For the output, the, dim, uh, the third index is equal to the number of filters. So let's say you have 20 filters, then the depth of your 3D array is 20. So at this point, you got rid of all the uh, R, G, and B layers. Like they all been compiled into a single layer. And then since you use 20 filters, you have 20 layers of those. And then M and N is just the uh, pixel dimensions of the image. So if your image is 512 by 512 pixels, then, it's just, then your output is just 512 by 512 by the 20 filters. So typically how the convolutional uh, layers work is that the first layer is for a very low level feature extraction. So example of low level is like I said earlier, edge detection. Like detecting a vertical or horizontal edge is pretty simple. And then example of a mid-level feature is maybe like a circle, a box, a curve. And then high-level feature is maybe like I guess something more complicated and specific, like, I don't know, a star shape. Not, not going to happen in ours, but just an example. Or like a chair, a car, person, etc. So here is an example of an image. And here they applied 16 different filters to give this output. So all of these 2D arrays will be stacked on top of each other, and then you get you get this 3D array that's described here. And then each of these are called a feature map. And the reason why is each one describes the presence or absence of a specific feature. So after, after you do the convolutional layer, um, we apply the re relu layer which um, basically you're running the values through the activation, activation function. So like you would be taking these values 
and then pixel wise you would be applying it to the uh, activation function and the reason why this is done is because it introduces um, non-linearity into the model and the reason why that is important is because frankly speaking most most phenomenons can't be described through a linear combination of numbers like I don't know something as simple as like a parabola right you can't fit that with a line so introducing non-linearity is important so that you can make your model more complex and um, after after you apply this activation function very frequently but not always you use something called a pooling layer and basically what that does is it samples subsections of the image and then more or less it compiles it to make the image uh, smaller so the most popular method is max pooling so you take a two by two subsection of the image and you just take the highest value and that becomes the output so here eight is the highest value you put eight here three and then four so if this were a 5 by 12 uh, 512 by 512 image then the output would be like 256 by 256 and this is usually where people start wondering like wouldn't that mean you're losing a lot more information because you're basically making the image lower resolution right so in this case that's actually a good thing because by making the image resolution lower in some sense you're reducing the chance of overfitting because you're it also smooths out the the noise a little bit and i guess like big picture wise it's a little bit more complicated than that but generally speaking you're just smoothing out the noise so then that way the the values that you have are more relevant and then on top of that um, i mean it's less numbers right so that also makes the model faster which is really important So basically, for feature, feature learning, you, 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 repeat, you repeat these a series of times. So you do convolution, you apply the activation function, you pull it, and then you repeat, and the dot, 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 you just keep doing that until you're satisfied. So generally speaking, your 3D matrix, the, uh, the first and second dimension gets smaller because recall that every time you apply the convolution, if there's no padding, it, it gets compressed. And then pooling also makes the first two dimensions smaller. But then as you're applying more and more filters, it get, also gets thicker just because you're getting, you're getting more attributes, so to speak. So this whole section is to, to figure out what features are important and you determine which features are important by assigning the different weights to all of these connections. So if the weight is higher, then that feature is more relevant for classifying the, uh, the, the image. So, then, so the reason why this network does feature selection by itself is because if the feature is not important, you just get like a really low weight. And then at that point, it's as if it's not really actually being used in the model. And in this final section is where each of these individual values in the final 3D matrix is flattened into a 1D vector. And then each, each one of these boxes is a, a neuron or a node. And then here you just have a multi-layer perception it does a bunch of calculations on the features that you had and then it adjusts the weights accordingly again and then you get your output and then the number of output neurons is equal to the number of classes that you have so in our example if you recall earlier we have six classes two for normal four for abnormal so here we would have six different output neurons so basically this section is feature extraction this is actual um, classification. So two different segments. So obviously this, this is a lot of, like frankly speaking, this is a lot of calculations and we all have lap laptops, maybe a desktop. So not like the supercomputers that people use to train these models. So practically speaking, we probably can't train an entire network 
So that's where transfer learning becomes really uh, important. So transfer learning is basically where you take a pre-trained model and then you kind of, I guess like you tweak it to your own purposes. So for the most part, you don't have to build everything from ground up. So for example, um, these are different convolutional neural networks that have been developed by various uh, professors or companies. And all of these have performed very well in different types of, uh, like, I guess, international competitions. I think ResNet, uh, sorry, not ResNet, the, the competition, basically, they give you like a million images, and then there's like 10,000 different classifications. It's like dog, cat, person, tree, bush. I don't know, it's really, it's really weird. So basically, it, it's able to discriminate between 10,000 different types of objects. And obviously, training that takes a long time. Like, a lot of these are trained with supercomputers, and even then, it takes several days to do. Um, so after they've trained it, I mean, it'd be kind of a waste if no one else used it, right? So what we can do is we can take this network, and we can freeze the weights found in this section. So basically, we're not training this section at all. And then we only train the classification layer. So if we are training less weights, then it's a lot faster for us to, to um, basically build our model. So that's good for us. But then that begs the question, why do we freeze the weights here and not the weights here? And the reason why is since those neural networks were used to classify such a wide range of different objects, chances are their feature extraction and feature selection methods are very robust. So like, there's no reason for us to try to recreate that. But then obviously we're not trying to classify trucks versus vans and bicycles. So we're, we're trying to classify different types of cells. So we would, be, we would be adjusting the weights for the classification section only. And then by doing that, we are basically just training a multi-layer perception. So even though our, la our model is a convolutional neural network, for our purposes, we are only training a multi-layer perceptron, which makes things much easier. So um, there's different degrees of transfer learning that you can do. So the, I guess one extreme example is if you retrain the entire model. So you, so you keep the architecture. You have the same number of hidden neurons. You have the same number of neurons in each layer, but you're readjusting all the weights. And that, that is also easier than building a model from scratch because a lot of times just knowing how many layers to have and how many neurons in each layer, that's really difficult. But chances are we aren't going to do this because that also takes a lot of time. And here what we can do is we can freeze certain layers. And this, this is faster, but it's also kind of hard because I guess like as undergrads for all of us, it's kind of hard to know which layers are relevant. So we basically would be sort of just blindly freezing things, and that's not going to work. So then, like I said earlier, the easiest way is if we freeze the convolutional layers and we only train the classification layers. So this is faster because it's less weights. It's simpler because it's easier for us to do. It's also less accurate, but I will say that the margin between the accuracy here and here is very small, like maybe a few percent. So in terms of uh, usefulness of our time, we probably it's probably not worth trying to bump it up by a few percentages. All right, so that wraps everything up for this workshop. And this was all theoretical stuff. For the next workshop, we will be implementing this in Python. So before the next workshop, make sure you go to this website. Um, I will send out these slides tonight, but yeah, take a picture if you want. And then um, basically, we need to download a package called Anaconda. And it has a bunch of different Python libraries that would be really useful. And it also has something called New, uh, Jupyter Notebook. And that's basically where we will be running our scripts. Unfortunately, this package doesn't contain the Keras package or TensorFlow. So you guys will have to download that independently. So how you do that is once you have the Anaconda distribution, you open the Anaconda prompt, 
not the command prompt. I know it looks similar, but it's different. So you go to the Anaconda prompt, and then it's really simple. It's, you just type in pip install, and then whatever package you want. So here, it says uh, small. It says pip install Keras, and then when you install it, you get basically all of this, and it's telling you if it's finished installing or not. Um, for TensorFlow, there's two options. Um, if your laptop has a dedicated graphics card, uh, you install TensorFlow-GPU. I'm guessing for most of, you, most of you guys, you probably have an integrated graphics card. In that case, you install this one instead. And um, the reason why it's different is, obviously, if you don't have a dedicated graphics card, this isn't going to work. But if you do have your own graphics card, uh, basically this package uses your GPU and CPU at the same time, which, uh, for lack of better explanation, is just faster because you're using more computing power at once. And then also, so I guess that's a little bit of homework. I need you guys to go get on your laptop later. Um, you don't have to do it right now. And basically look at the processor, graphics card, and RAM. And then basically, I guess, like, tell that to me. Because th this will help me distribute the, the computational workload a little bit better. Because obviously, it doesn't make sense to have someone with a slower laptop to train a model that will take a longer time to do. But as a disclaimer, uh, computational burden does not correlate with human effort. So if you have a slower laptop, that doesn't mean you'll be doing less things. That just means you'll probably be using one of the architectures that are less complicated, so you're not like, so that you don't lose control of your laptop for like three days. But yeah, that's everything. Uh, does anyone have questions? It's a lot to, it's a lot of content, but we're trying to cram it into two workshops, and we'll have all semester learn all this. So definitely don't be worried if a lot of it went over your head. The most important thing is the exposure, and then over time it starts clicking. Yeah, any questions?